Hello and welcome to part 2 of my Bevy Game Jam devlog. When we left off to the end of the last video, which you can find linked in the description if you have not watched that already, I reached what I considered the minimum viable product for a game that could be submitted. In reality, it was nothing more than a simple concept that could be used to, say, present ideas to friends of mixing elements together. It had no fluff, no story, nothing that made it into more than a game that lets you mix two things together and get a third thing out. And it also had none of the quality of life things that you would expect from a game, like persistent state. Instead, every time you restarted the game, it would be back to where it was the first time you started. So with all that in mind, the game was far from what I would call complete. The first thing I decided to move on to was the saving system. I saw this as the most critical next step, because without this, I wouldn't be able to implement any of the story elements and the game would become immensely tedious in order to progress to the end of it that I made for the jam because you would have to start from the beginning each time. This is also in extra critical because of the type of story I wanted to implement being a meta-humor story would require the game to be restarted in order to progress. And without a save system, there would be no way to track how many times the player had restarted the game. I did this by taking the simplest approach I could possibly imagine. Simply take each item spawned into the world and then look up its name and store that in a file, one per line. Then next to that, store the location that that item is in the world, allowing for you to position things in a layout and they will be reloaded into that same position when you reopen. This approach is simplistic enough that it shouldn't have problems with adding and removing items or if the hashing changes between updates of the game because the item is not saved in its serialized form but instead reconverted to its unhashed version allowing for you to also read a save in a human readable format that can then indicate to you what items you've actually found and also add items to the save without needing to know what their hashed values would be. I implemented this by using Bevy's query system. I would query all items, I would query all entities in the world with the item ID component and their transforms and then iterate through this placing one item on each line of the file with the corresponding serialized form of the transform next to it. This did result in a small bug later on that I didn't anticipate when I added the ability to spawn items into the world from a menu because the menu also used item IDs and transforms in order to post in the world. This resulted in them being saved to the save file each time the game was saved and restarted and spawning in as items instead of the UI. This was easily fixed by putting a flag in place on the UI items that prevented them from being serialized. I also had to implement a system that checked to see if it was a debug item and would not serialize debug items to the save. This also has a bug with it that it will save debug items if the item that you spawned in wasn't a debug item because the way the debug item works is it looks up the item and if it doesn't get it, it gets the debug item instead. This means that when you're serializing them, they are not actually considered the debug item despite being the debug item in the game. This is actually in my opinion, more of a feature than a bug because it means that when you load a game that had a bug, it will show you that that bug was there. And then the next time you save, it will go away. As opposed to simply throwing a silent error that you may not know why it's not working. Between each item's name, there was a colon placed and then the serialized form of the transform. This meant that to load a game after you restarted it, I simply iterated through the file one line at a time, splitting at the colon, hashing the left side into the item ID, and then using ron to deserialize the right side into a transform, then sending a spawn at event for each item ID and the corresponding location. Then it was off to implement the meta story. This required the save and load system. The first thing I did for the story was I changed the splash screen from just disappearing to instead shrink down to the size of an item before disappearing and then would spawn a corresponding bevy item at zero zero where it had just disappeared from. This item was then used to quote unquote construct the game that you're playing. By restarting the game, it is possible to acquire more than one bevy item. That item can then be combined with itself or other items that you unlock later to progress the game story and unlock game features. This also required the implementation of a system that would check to make sure Bevy hadn't spawned too many Bevy items in 
This simply is to prevent clutter if the game was restarted multiple times as you got further into the game. Because I could imagine if you made this game quite large and someone restarted it four or five times, the number of bevy items would just be a pain to have scattered around. So once there is two up bevy items in the world, then no more will be spawned when the game restarts. By pressing B, you can spawn bevy items. This is also in the item's description to allow people to progress the story without having to actually restart the game, despite that being the intended approach to progress through the story. Obviously, after having the meta story required us to restart the game, it was important that the game save on quit, not just on the timer that I'd implemented to save the game every 30 seconds. This would mean that when you quit the game, you guaranteed didn't lose any progress. Obviously, for the story to be implemented any further than the simple meta thing of needing to restart the game, I needed item descriptions so that there could actually be a written story and some hints to people about what items you might want to try and combine with things in order to progress. So my, my idea of doing this was to add a simple string that would be displayed at the bottom of the screen in the tooltip as the item's description. Originally, I intended to have the tooltips be unlocked later on in the game, but I figured that the game may be too confusing and daunting if you simply had no information and had to blindly combine items and not even realize that the game could be restarted to get more bevies. So the play of the game would require some direction. So tooltips was the approach I took and they would display the description. I could then add to the description of each item details about how to progress to the next item that you may need to progress the story. This was added to the serialization system of loading items from a file by simply putting a description, then a colon, and then a string between quotations of what the description is. This also allows for things like new lines and other Unicode characters to be encoded because it is RON deserialized. If the description is not provided in the item file, it says this, this item does not have a description. After adding the de item descriptions to a whole bunch of items that were story related, I then needed a way to display them. As mentioned, I intended to do this through tooltips. This was done by simply spawning a UI box on the screen and sim attaching it to the bottom. This would then show the name of an item and a description when you right clicked them. I changed this to simply being hover because this required no input from me as the game designer to tell the user how to get an item's description because it is in human nature to put the mouse over the item at some point which would reveal it whereas right clicking it may not be as intuitive. When implementing the tool tips it showed one of the weaknesses of Bevy being such a young game engine, and it is missing a lot of convenience functionality that more mature game engines have by default, such as if I was creating this feature in Unity, there is an ability to import and then split an image into parts so that when it scales inside a Flexbox, certain parts do not scale equally. This is great for making containers since you can make the border of the container not scale at the same rate as the, the center that contains the contents. I instead had to implement this self inside of Bevy. This was done by simply spawning a single UI element and then spawning inside nine smaller containers with the correct scaling and flex applied to them so that the center could load to stretch to fill the entire thing and the edges would never be any wider than a specified size. This was done with nine boxes so that the four corners could be Ten, um, 10 pixels by 10 pixels and the top and bottom could be 10 pixels high by the width minus 20 wide and the edges could be 10 wide by the width minus 20 high and then making the center box simply fill to fit the size of the outside container minus 20 height and width. Once that was implemented it was simply displaying text fields and applying marker flags to them so that I can easily acquire and edit them at runtime. I then progressed on making the game playable and the story thematic in, in that when you combine enough bevies together in the right way, you end up building a quote unquote game. And then this will cause every 10 seconds after a void item to spawn in the world. This void item is then used to combine either with bevy again in order to unlock a new feature or with itself to unlock the next item. You can then combine and continue to extrapolate out more and more item. This was then expanded to spawn the time item after five minutes of playing the game. This item is more or less the last non-obtainable item from Void. Everything else can be built from Void or time in some abstract way. While I was laying in bed that night, after doing all this coding all day, I had the brilliant idea occur to me about how the game was doing with recipes. 
and a small and simple modification I could make that would reduce the size of the hash maps needed and simultaneously speed up all lookup and store process times. Since all recipes in the game, for at least my design vision, are the same forwards and backwards, and because I was using a U64 to represent the IDs, it was possible to easily order items in the recipes. And if I did this ordering before inserting the recipes into the map, I could then use this ordering to extrapolate the other recipe without storing it directly. Because of the way that the numbers would result, this prevented duplicate recipes from needing to be stored. This would also prevent this also removed the need to check to see if I was adding the item to itself and therefore only insert that recipe once to prevent duplicate items spawning. Since when ordering, I would not need to do the second insertion. I could just assume that the insertion was correct each time. This means both inserting and looking up the recipes would be faster because you would only have to check one of the two pairs or insert one of the two pairs. And the comparison of two U64s on almost every architecture is extremely fast. And the only bit of the code that really changes is which item is considered to be first. This also reduces the memory because you only store one single copy instead of both. This can be pictured as a two dimensional array of n by n size, where n is the number of items in the game. The old way I was doing this would require populating both positions in the array represented of the X and the Y for both items, resulting in two spots in the array being filled for each recipe, unless of course the recipe was itself, combined with itself. Whereas the new system allowed you to rearrange the X and Y so that the X was always bigger than the Y, meaning that everything beyond the diagonal line in this two by two array is unreachable and therefore does not need to be initialized and effectively reduces the size of the array by half at an infinite n without losing access to any of the information that would otherwise be stored in the side of the array that you cannot reach because all you need to access that data is to flip the x and the y and this would there in turn because of the mirroring of the array result in getting the data that would have been placed there this obviously only works because in the game all recipes are the same regardless of which items you combine. And because of the mathematical property that A plus B equals C and B plus A equals C. If this wasn't true, then this approach would not work. After the miraculous improvement of performance that I really did not need, I moved on to adding what is referred to as juice. This definitely doesn't have anything at all to do with me not wanting to work on the tag system. You know, it's wasn't at all just procrastination, so adding features that were not necessary. And so, you know, I decided to enable Bevy's wave feature and, you know, add sounds that played every time you spawn an item. The item could then be configured when creating it in the items file to play what sound it wanted, or if the sound wasn't specified, it would just play a default pop sound. I then went on to make sound effects for a whole bunch of items, I didn't want to use pre-made sound effects, so all the sound effects in the game, I believe, are just me making noises at my desk into my microphone. I would have gone and made even more sounds, but I ran out of time. Otherwise, I would have gone around with my phone and got sound effects for other things as well. But some things obviously couldn't have sounds attached to them, because, like, what is the sound of grass? And some items have duplicate sound effects, uh, because they just made sense to have the same sound effect such as all the meta game items about programming all have the typing sound effect. Then after spending way, way too long after making bad programmer art for the items I had made so far in the game, I moved on to the, making the recipes keep track of all previously combined recipes that had resulted in an item, and then saving this to a file when you quit and reloading it when you start the game back up. This is later used to prevent you from making the same combination multiple times, because it is annoying when you're trying to find obscure recipes if you keep accidentally making the same thing over and over. This originally would have been useful for being able to get to items that you had already unlocked before, the item, uh, before I added the ability to spawn items in, because you'd be able to recreate things twice. I then had to, when I implemented that feature, change some of the recipes because it wasn't possible to get to that point in the game 
without making the same item twice. So I simply made the item give itself. With a few small changes and s some stupid bug hunting, I made the game load the items and recipes from the assets folder as the root recursively, rather than just from their respective files. This made it easier to group items into mods and their own folders, since you could just make the folder with the items and recipes folders in them, and then add or remove the folder when you wanted to load the mods. I then spent a while trying to figure out how to make the asset paths relative, so that when you have a mod loaded, you could have the icons inside that mod folder, and you don't have really long chains of uh, file names trying like describing how to get from the assets folder. This would then also make mod packs much more easier because you could simply put a mod in a folder of a mod pack or break your mod into sub modules and have them in their own folders and not have to worry about how the file structure is constructed around them or what folder they are in inside the assets folder since they are loaded relatively. After doing some testing of the game, I realized it would be quite important to be able to remove items from the world once you started spawning them in. So I added the trash item that is unlocked by combining bevy and void, because I thought that was thematically appropriate. This would then give you the trash item. When the game starts up, it inserts for every item that was loaded the trash recipe, which is basically the item combined with trash will result in trash. This would then allow the items to be destroyed without removing the trash item from the game before the ability to spawn items back in. This item recipe was inserted with the maximum possible priority, meaning that it can be very easily overwritten by any other mod that wants to say have their item trashed turn into an, a different item that isn't the trash. The, this could be an interesting mechanic used. Finally, with a way to clean up the screen, it was required that you would have to keep track of all the items that you had unlocked, so that in the future when you were spawning, going to spawn items in, we could then know what items you had unlocked without, you know, needing to know, keep a direct access to them by having them spawn in the world. This required some duplication of the tooltip code, and then making it stick to the right side of the screen instead of the bottom, and changing the height and width. And bada boom bada bing, we have ourselves a spawn item menu. I then used the flex box functionality to spawn in some bevy UI buttons. Then I made each recipe that when it gets made, insert the items that it made into a resource. This resource is then used when the items menu is spawned to populate it with all the items you've previously unlocked. And then in the future, every time an item is spawned, it is added to the spawns list. Using flex, this all UL lines up. These buttons keep track of the item ID and when clicked will spawn in randomly on the screen somewhere the item that was they represent. With this implemented, I figured the game was at a point where I can call it good. I had 12 hours left in the game jam, so I figured upload something now before I run out of time and miss my chance to submit. You'll notice that I didn't use the tag system that I'd spent so much time on talking about in the plan and creating in the first part. And this nagged at me and nagged at me. So I added it. Real easy, real fast. Basically, when you add a recipe, you can prefix one or both parts of the recipe with a dollar sign. This will tell the parser that you're declaring a tag. Then once it's loaded all the items, it will loop over each recipe. And when it finds one with a single tag, it will go through all items with that tag and add the recipe of that item plus the other item that you specified equals the result specified. If both parties are a tag, then it will simply iterate through them in a nested loop process doing the same thing. If a single item is a tag, the item is automatically assigned a priority of one, and if both items are tags, it is assigned a priority of two. This is important because it means that if you specify an item-item combination and don't specify a priority, it's considered to be the, the optimal choice when spawning items. Whereas if you pick an item tag combination and don't give an otherwise specified priority, it is considered to be a lower priority than a item item combination, but more important than a tag tag combination. Then a tag tag obviously falls into the third slot. You can specify these to be higher priorities by putting the semicolon at the end and the priority. But this does mean that if you specify 
an override recipe, basically, it will override the tag tag recipe with the tag item recipe or an item item recipe, meaning that you don't have to worry about weird combinations spawning things that shouldn't apply. To make this fast and easy, I simply implemented a hash map to the items resource that contained the tag ID and then a hash set of all items with that tag. And then as the game loads items in, it'll iterate through the tags that you've specified for that item and insert its ID into the hash set for that tag. Then when you are trying to look up what items have a tag, you simply request that hash set with the corresponding tag ID. I then added a whole bunch of food items to test the system out. Obviously none of these can be accessed from the game itself directly, simply because I did not have time to come up and implement recipes for them all without needing to do a whole lot more art in order to make it not really stupid recipes. I picked food specifically because there was a whole bunch of free assets that I could use for it, and it had a really obvious use for tags, in that I can tag all food with perishable, and then add a recipe that says anything with perishable plus time equals mold. I then add a few overrides for certain things. So if you want to play around with this or have any suggestions or recipes that you think would be cool, feel free to submit a pull request on the GitHub repository found in the description. The final thing I did before putting this new version up onto the game jam was add the ability to implement a patch file. This is done by basically putting a file with a .vp file extension. These again are found with a recursive search from the assets file. This allows you to apply tags to items that already exist but are not implemented from your mod. This is done for example if you wanted to patch an item only if it exists and not actually add the item yourself. This will in the future have other functionality, if I ever get around to implement it, of having say global variable states that can be uh, requested by the patch to decide if it adds a collection of recipes or something. The main reason of this being that you may have a mod that has say a magic flag that enables certain recipes that don't make sense outside of the context of magic or a science flag that makes all the recipes science-based. And so when mods work together, one might enable this in their mod so that it enables or disables a whole bunch of recipes based on what someone else's mod is specifying. This will also in the future allow you to say, patch other tags. So what you would do, you'd say in the patch file that all items with the bird tag should also get these other tags. This would mean that you can modify it a whole bunch of items that you didn't add to have the functionality that you would want from yours. Then you could also say in the patch file, have a whole bunch of rules that apply that the, if these two tags exist on an item, add this other tag, or if these tags exist and this one doesn't. But all that functionality is a future update to be added. That brings us to the end of this video and the development of this game. Found in the description, you'll find a link to the jam page. If you wanna go rate my game, or rate any of the other games that have been uploaded by other people involved in the jam. At the time of making this video, there are still five days left to vote. So please do go and check out the jam and have a lot of fun playing everyone else's submissions. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video that I upload, whether that's a Bevy Basics or maybe another devlog series that I have planned since 500 subs that I you know, still haven't made. <laughs> Enjoy!